Okay, this is plant structure, which is concept one notes. And as we talk about plant structure, we're also going to talk a bit about the diversity of plants because plants are one of the most diverse kingdoms. There's so many different types. So in order to dive into the structure, we kind of have to be able to categorize plants into different groupings so that we can really understand their structure better. But before we do that, I want to go over a few things that you should remember or already know about plants. So first, plants are living things, and there are certain characteristics that all living things have in common that you should remember. So all living things are made of cells. Those are the most basic unit of life. Um, all living things have some sort of genetic material, whether that be DNA or RNA or both. Um, all living things respond to stimuli. They all grow and reproduce. They all have the ability to adapt to their environment or have these adaptations that allow them to survive in an environment. So these are some of the things that they all have in common. So that is all apply to plants as well because plants are living things. Oh, and of course, they all have to be able to obtain and then use energy, and plants are no exception. And if you remember, plants, they do cellular respiration too, just like animals, but they have a special way that they can actually harness energy from the sun and store it and convert it into chemical energy through a process called photosynthesis. That's how they're making their own food is through photosynthesis. Now, another key theme of all biology is that the structure of something dictates its function. Structure dictates function. So the way something is designed is going to determine how it will then function. Those are intrinsically connected. And the same is true for plants. We're going to see as we look at their structure. The way that a plant's designed structurally enables it to obtain the nutrients it needs in order to do photosynthesis. So if you remember from photosynthesis, excuse me, plants need water and carbon dioxide and they also need sunlight. So every category of plant, no matter how diverse, has to have the ability to obtain these things in order to do what it's designed to do. So before we jump into kind of the diverse structure of plants, I wanna review some of the commonalities among all plants. So, if you remember from our cells unit, plants are made of cells, and specifically they're made of plant cells, which are eukaryotic cells. And there are some special characteristics that plant cells have that are different from, say, animal cells like ours. So there are a lot of similarities, but some of the differences, we have these chloroplasts, we have our cell wall, and then we have this giant storage molecule called a central vacuole. But again, they are eukaryotic cells just like ours, so they have all the organelles that are common to eukaryotes, like having a nucleus and ribosomes and mitochondria, that kind of thing. All plants are multicellular organisms. They're made of more than one cell, and some are even made of millions of cells. And all plants have the ability to do photosynthesis. It's a metabolic process for converting solar energy from the sun into chemical energy, which is stored in sugar, specifically glucose, that the plant is then able to use, and other organisms who eat the plants are able to use. So let's jump into some of the diversity. It's really hard to kind of summarize all of this and without sitting here for hours lecturing to you. So I'm trying to give you a flow chart to make this as simple and as clear as possible, but just know that I'm oversimplifying a very complex kingdom just for the sake of understanding. So when we're looking at plants, we generally divide them into two categories, non-vascular plants and vascular plants. So we're going to keep adding on to this flow chart, but I'm going to dive in first and talk to you about each one of these, and then we'll get more specific into types of non-vascular and types of vascular. So non-vascular versus vascular. The main difference is that non-vascular plants do not have something called vascular tissue. Vascular tissue, we'll talk a bit more about in a minute, but it is a type of conductive tissue that allows nutrients to be moved up and down a plant large distances. So because non-vascular plants don't have vascular tissue, they tend to be smaller. Um, 
since they don't have the ability to transport water and other nutrients up stems or up giant tree trunks like we see in this picture of the vascular tree on the right. Instead, to obtain water, they absorb it via osmosis. So if you remember from learning about cellular transport, osmosis is the diffusion of water from high concentrations of water to low concentrations of water. So that's how they are going to obtain water. They don't have true leaves, stems, or roots. So that is another thing that they're majorly lack lacking in structure. Instead, they have the body part of them is called the thallus, and then they have these rhizoids, which are kind of their root-like structure, which allow them to absorb water via osmosis. So here's a picture of a ton of moss, which is a non-vascular plant, all over some rocks, and it looks like an old tree stump. Now, much different, as we can see from this massive tree, which is a vascular plant. Vascular plants, that's the difference. They have vascular tissue, which is called xylem and phloem, which we'll talk a little bit more when we get into vascular into more detail. This is so critical because it allows them to move water and sugars all throughout the plant, so the plants can be much bigger. And because they're bigger, they're more complex and specialized in design. So they have specialized organs to allow them to do certain functions that non-vascular plants can't do. And these organs are roots, stems, and leaves. So we're going to talk about vascular plants more in a bit, but I want to stop first and give non-vascular plants their time. So if we were going to subdivide non-vascular plants, that category even more, we would divide them into mosses, liverworts, and hornworts. So I'm going to talk to you about each of those. Okay, so types of non-vascular plants. So the mosses, like we see in this picture pretty clearly, they're really small and dense. Um, I was literally about to say they look like fuzzy green carpet, which I had already, I guess, put in the notes, knew what I was going to say. Um, yeah, I just, that's exact, that's the best description I can think of it if you've never seen it in person. And mosses can live in any biome, which is pretty cool. You can find them in the tundra, you can find them in a rainforest, in a deciduous forest, all sorts of places that they can live. And this is really important because mosses are a very, very critical organism because they can help prevent erosion um, in the sense of how they, they cover and protect different surfaces. Liverworts, again, I, I told you this is very brief. I'm not doing them the justice I should, but that's just because I'm trying to give you an overview of structure just so you can appreciate the structure and diversity of plants. All right, back to liverworts. So they have liver-shaped lobes, um, that you may think kind of look like leaves, but they're not considered true leaves. Um, they also can live in any biome, just like mosses, but they prefer to be in tropical um, environments. They like dimmer light, which can help if they're in a big tropical rainforest and there's a lot of larger organisms that are covering the sun that gives them more dim light. And then where there's a lot of precipitation, so they can have that nice damp soil. Now, something interesting about liverworts that distinguishes them from mosses and hornworts is they do not have stomata. And we're going to talk a lot more about stomata in the future because they're a very important structure. But stomata are like little pores in a plant that allow gases to move in and out. So they allow CO2 to come in for doing photosynthesis and then oxygen to be released as a product of photosynthesis. Um, they also release water, excess water, during transpiration, but liverworts don't have that. They have these specialized gas chambers that essentially do the same thing, just not as well as stomata. And then hornworts. They're called hornworts because they have kind of like a horn-shaped structure that protrudes out of them. And they can also live in any biome, but they too prefer tropical. Because again, remember, these non-vascular plants are obtaining water via osmosis. So they have to be near water so that they can simply absorb it. Um, they, can't, they don't have the root structures like vascular plants to be able to stretch out and, and obtain it somewhere else. A unique fact about hornworts is they only have one chloroplast in every plant cell, which is much different from mosses and liverworts, and then also much different from vascular plants. So really, if they only have one chloroplast per plant cell, that means they can't do as much photosynthesis, which is fine because these tend to be smaller structures. So they don't need to do it as much. Okay, so just a refresher, the two broad categories, again, are non-vascular plants. Here's a picture of some moss growing on a wall. And then vascular, which is getting into flowers and trees and ferns and a bunch of other things. So 
let's talk more about those vascular plants, those more complex ones that have that vascular tissue, which is super important. So if you remember when we were learning about um, cell differentiation, you may remember that a living thing is also known as an organism, and organisms are made of organ systems. Plants have two organ systems, vascular plants. They have the root system, which is essentially everything underground, and then the shoot system, which is everything above ground. Organ systems are composed of organs, and there are three critical organs in vascular plants. We have our roots, which are a part of the root system. They absorb water and nutrients, and then they also help keep the plant anchored. Um, roots can have these root hairs on them to kind of increase their surface area and ability to absorb water. They can be tap roots, which is one like really long, thick root, or they can have a fibrous root system that kind of spreads all throughout. So roots have some variation within them as well. Another critical organ, is the stem. So the stem is this part right here, kind of like your stalk, if you will, and it transports fluids and stores nutrients. So this is where we're going to find a lot of that vascular tissue that is so important, and it has specialized cells within it that allow for new growth and also support the leaves, which is the third critical organ. Leaves are our photosynthetic structure. They are specialized for doing photosynthesis. They collect sunlight through um, the pigment chlorophyll, which is stored in our chloroplast. And then they have stomata, which are those pores I told you about that are specialized for gas exchange, but they also allow transpiration to happen and release excess water. So these are the three organs. Now, organisms are made of organ systems, which are made of organs, and organs are made of tissues. So there are some special tissues we need to know about as well. So all of these organs have the following three tissues. They're dermal tissue, ground tissue, and then vascular tissue, which we've kind of already mentioned. We can see all of those in this tree trunk here. Um, all plants do something called primary growth, which is allow them, which is what allows them to kind of grow up and down. But some plants also do secondary growth, which is what allows them to grow outwards and build those layers outwards. Like we can see these rings in a tree trunk. If a plant doesn't do secondary growth, it's it's a more it's considered to be an herbaceous plant. But the ones that do do the secondary growth, it's pretty cool because we can see these rings in the tree trunk allow us to um, know how old the tree is to age it based on the rings, and then also to know about what the environment was like and the climate during that year that it was growing. the The wider those rings, the more growth the more nutrients the plant was able to grow and the healthier it was able to be, whereas a narrower ring would show a lack of nutrients and a lack of secondary growth. So that's kind of, I digress, but plants are just really awesome and their structure is super complex and cool. But I want to talk to you about each of these types of tissues. So dermal tissue is what we usually see as kind of like the outer structure and it's used for protection and it's also helpful to prevent water loss. Yes, plants do transpiration and they release excess water, but they also need to retain water for their own processes as well. Remember, plants need water for photosynthesis. That's really important. So this includes epidermis um, mostly, but it also incl includes periderm, which is more like bark. Um, of course, not all plants um, have periderm and have that bark, but they all have some sort of dermal tissue. And that also includes the cuticle, which is kind of the waxy layer that you can see and feel on a lot of plants, particularly their leaves. Vascular tissue is what makes vascular plants vascular plants, and this is for transport. The xylem is what's transporting water that's being absorbed in the roots of the plant, and then the xylem makes it possible for that water to get up through the shoot system of the plant and get to those leaves and other organs. The phloem is what's moving minerals from the roots to the shoot, and then it's taking sugars that are made during photosynthesis in those leaves, which I told you is the photosynthetic structure of the plant, and it's able to move that to other parts of the plant as well. So I just think phloem food. It's kind of moving the food part, and then xylem is moving the water. And there's a picture of celery here because these little 
dots you can see in your celery stalk, those are actually the bundles of xylem and phloem that are going to be transporting these water and nutrients, which is pretty cool. Okay, and then the last tissue I want to talk about is ground tissue. So this is used for metabolism, it's used for storing, and then it's also used for supporting. So if you're not sure about the type of tissue, if it's not dermal, if it's not vascular, it's going to fall into this ground tissue category. There are a couple types of ground tissue as well, so we can get even more specialized. Remember, tissues, we have the organism, the organ system, the organs, the tissue, and then tissues are made of cells. So a couple types of cells that make up ground tissues. We have parenchyma, um, which are your traditional plant cells that you would think of, that you would draw a picture of. We have colenchyma, which is more of like the supportive cells, kind of like cellulose um, and those structural cells. And then sclerenchyma, which is wooded and durable. So this is even more structural. This is what we have like kind of in the middle of an apple core that doesn't, like you can eat it. It just doesn't taste as good because it's, you know, got that wooded feel to it right there in the middle. Okay, back to our flow chart. We haven't forgotten. So remember, plants are either split into non-vascular and vascular. We've talked a lot about those two different categories, and we've talked about the three types of non-vascular plants, but now I want to get into more specifics of vascular plants. And there's kind of three categories of vascular plants. We can subdivide them into angiosperms, gymnosperms, and seedless vascular, vascular plants. So let's talk about each of those. Angiosperms, these have seeds, which we'll talk more about seeds in a bit, and they are considered to be the flowering plants. So they have flowers. The flower is critical because it's not just to be pretty, it's their reproductive structure, which we'll talk more about it in a minute. They have these seeds that they have are enclosed in an ovary, which when ripened becomes fruit, which we'll talk about more too. And their seeds are dispersed by animals, um, typically, in order to spread them. Gymnosperms, these have seeds as well. They do not have flowers or fruits though. Instead, they're using cones as their reproductive structure and their seeds are dispersed typically by the wind. And then last we have the seedless vascular plants and these are the ones that look the most similar to non-vascular but they don't have that vascular tissue so that's a huge distinction. They don't have seeds so this is ferns and then club mosses which is a specific type of plant we'll talk about. They reproduce most similarly to non-vascular plants and they use spores and we'll have a whole concept on reproduction, I promise. So this is just kind of your general overview of the three categories and then a picture of each one. And then those spores typically get dispersed via water, um, which is similar to how non-vascular plants reproduce. So some really big differences between these three categories. So I want to zoom in because I told you this flower is a really special structure in angiosperms and it's the reproductive structure. So we're going to talk through the parts of a flower. So what are they and what are they used for? All right, the sepal. That's what we see like right here. These look like little tiny leaves. They're green tissue um, that covers the flower when it's a bud before it has bloomed. The petals, those are the colorful structures that we that plants use to attract specific pollinators. Um, so the color does matter and the style matters. All right, now the pistil. All of this is considered the pistil, and these are the female organs of the flower. So you have the ovule, which is the female germ cell that will become a seed once the egg is made and then obviously fertilized by a sperm. It is protected within the ovary, and then when that ovary ripens, that's what becomes fruit. So fruit has the seeds in it because it is the ovary that has ripened. And then kind of more externally, you have the stigma, which is um, this opening at the top of the style. So the style is kind of like the long neck, and the sperm are going to travel through the stigma, down the style, in order to get to the egg um, and make fertilization possible. All right, the stamen, that's referring to the male organs in the flower. So the anther is what makes pollen and it sends, sits on the end of a filament. Um, the pollen is made by gymnosperms as well, but it's in their cones. Um, and then in angiosperms, it's in the flowers because the flower is the reproductive structure of an angiosperm. 
And the powdery substance um, of pollen is made of pollen grains, which are the male gametophyte that's going to then later give rise to sperm cells. Um, plant reproduction is a little bit complicated, so we're saving it kind of for a whole other concept in concept two. But I did want to cover the structure here first just to kind of introduce it to you. Okay, last thing we need to do, one more kind of subdivision, because again, plants are so diverse, we're just barely skimming the surface. But I want to talk more about angiosperms, those flowering plants. Those can be even further subdivided into monocots and dicots. So types of angiosperms. Monocots. They have one cotyledon in the seed embryo. And that is like kind of like a seed leaf that you can see within it. So that's where the monocot comes from in one cotyledon for the name of it. Dicots have two, hence the name Dicot, dicotyledon. In monocots, they have parallel leaf veins. If you can um, look at this flower here, this is spiderwort. They have parallel leaf veins, whereas dicots have branching leaf veins, which you can see really well in this um, nasturtium flower right here. Monocots, their flower petals grow in multiples of three, which we can again see here, one, two, three, but they could also have six or they could have nine. Um, dicots, there's growing multiples of four or five. So you can see in this one, two, three, four, five. That's showing it's a dicot. Monocots, their root system is net like and fibrous. So um, I always think of monocots like if you've ever gone to like a home store and gotten those plants like in the long tray where you kind of get like six by two. So you get like 12 little plants and then you pull them up and they, they kind of have like all of those white fibrous veins or roots, excuse me, just kind of spread throughout the soil. That's what you're seeing when you're talking about this net-like or fibrous root system. Whereas dicots have a tap root system. They'll have like one main central root that can obviously have root hairs and stuff on it, but that kind of anchors the plant. Examples of some common monocots you probably know of, grass, I'm sure most of you know what grass is, um, lilies, bananas, daffodils, asparagus, orchids, tulips, wheat, sugarcane, those are all monocots. And then dicots are like dandelions, daisies, apples, peaches, roses, tomatoes, carrots, etc. All right, that is our concept one notes on plant structure.